This is the first video in a series on complex numbers, where you will develop a thorough understanding of exactly why they arise, what they are, and how to represent them in Cartesian, polar, and exponential forms. I will eventually introduce you to the Mandelbrot set, complex roots of unity, and Euler's famous identity, e to the i pi equals negative 1. Some of the most fascinating and wonderful mathematical observations have stemmed from an investigation of complex numbers. However, to understand them, it is first necessary to build a foundation of what complex numbers are. And we will do this by first understanding the sets of numbers, the fundamental theorem of algebra, and then defining the imaginary unit. Let's look at all the sets of numbers. The most basic set is the natural numbers, whole numbers such as 1, 2, and 3, etc. Next, integers are not much different. They include the natural numbers, but also house 0 and the negative numbers. Then rational numbers include integers and natural numbers, and can be described as fractions, where the denominator is not 0, meaning they have predictable decimals that run in some pattern. Each of these sets sits under the larger umbrella of real numbers, which also includes the irrational numbers such as e, pi, and phi, which have infinite decimals and often cannot be described exactly by a fraction. They are a set that sits separate from the other real numbers. The first step in understanding complex numbers is by accepting that there could be a set of numbers that exists outside of the reals. There is no immediate intuition as to why, but figuring this out is exactly the aim of this video, discovering the complex set. What does it mean to have a set of non-real numbers? Why would we even bother to define it? And what necessity would it have? Asking these questions has now equipped us to make a simple, yet fundamental observation about polynomials. And that is, some polynomials have no real roots. We can observe this in a simple diagram, where the function p of x is displayed. It has no x-intercepts, and therefore its solutions cannot exist in the set of real numbers. Then, the solutions must be complex. It is out of necessity to solve these polynomials that we can simply understand why complex numbers exist, what they are, and how to define them. To find the roots of a polynomial like this, we should reference the fundamental theorem of algebra, proved by Gauss in 1799, which states that every polynomial equation of degree n with complex number coefficients has n roots in the complex numbers. Let's quickly define some of these terms for you in case you need a refresher. A polynomial is an algebraic expression with variables and coefficients. For example, x cubed plus 2x squared plus 10x minus 20. We can make a polynomial equation by letting a polynomial equal 0. The degree is the highest power of a variable within a polynomial. In this example, the degree is 3, but Gauss's theorem proves a property for polynomials of any degree n. The roots of a polynomial are considered as its solutions, the values of x for which a polynomial equation is satisfied. And finally, just remember that the real numbers sit within the set of complex numbers. So natural numbers, integers, rational and irrational numbers are all technically complex numbers. Basically what Gauss proved is that all polynomials with complex coefficients have solutions in the set of complex numbers, and that the number of solutions they have is equal to their degree. Let's use this property to try and break some fundamental rules that we understand about the real numbers, to discover what else lies within the complex set. Observe the function p of x equals x squared plus 1. Here we have a polynomial with a degree of 2, so according to Gauss, it should have two roots, solutions of x where the function is equal to 0. However, by looking at its graph, this seems impossible. The polynomial doesn't intersect the x-axis. There are no obvious solutions. But because we trust Gauss's theorem, Let's try to solve for its roots anyway. First, we must create a polynomial equation, x squared plus 1 equals 0. Let's subtract 1 and then take the square root of both sides. What we find is that something apparently wrong has occurred here. This is a non-negotiable for real numbers, as no real number can be squared to produce a negative number. Let's quickly prove this by looking at all possible cases for the real number n. Let n belong to the set of real numbers, and let there exist a, which is a positive real number, such that a squared is greater than 0. This should be intuitive, as a positive real number squared will always be positive. Case 1 is that n equals a, implying that n is greater than 0 as a is positive. Here we are proving for all cases where n is positive. See that n multiplied by n equals n squared, and that we can introduce an equivalence to a multiplied by a equals a squared. We deduct that the left and right hand sides of both equations are equal, and therefore state that n squared equals a squared. This implies that n squared is greater than 0, as we initially stated that a squared is greater than 0. In case 2, we follow the same method, but things get more interesting. Say that n equals negative a, implying that n is less than 0. This means that we are proving for all cases where n is negative. 
Likewise, n multiplied by n equals n squared, introducing our equivalence, and negative a multiplied by negative a equals a squared. We can once again pair the left and right sides, implying that n squared equals a squared, and that n squared is greater than zero. Here, we have conclusively found that n squared is greater than zero for all positive and negative values of n. However, we must be sure not to forget the final case, case three, where n is equal to zero. A zero is a non-positive, non-negative, yet real number. n multiplied by n equals zero, therefore n squared equals zero. All cases for n have been tested, and we can therefore say with certainty that for all values of n belonging to the set of real numbers, n squared is greater than or equal to zero. Additionally, it follows that the square root of a negative number cannot be real, because when squared, it has a negative product, which is less than zero, not abiding to our newly proven rule. These two findings are integral to the next portion of the video, so I will box them and simplify them appropriately. Returning to where we left off the polynomial equation of p of x, let's apply our new discoveries. Our solution, the square root of negative one, matches the second rule, implying that the roots of our polynomial cannot be real. This is consistent with our earlier observations, but provides a more rigorous explanation as to why. Now we understand that the roots of this polynomial must belong to the set of complex numbers. We have found the necessity for the complex set. In other words, x is purely imaginary. It sits outside of the reals, but within the complex set. I say purely because what we will come to discover is that some complex numbers have real and imaginary parts. Before we finalize our solution to this fascinating polynomial equation, Recognize that we have just made a significant discovery. In mathematics, the square root of negative one is called the imaginary unit, and it is denoted as i. Therefore, x equals positive negative i. Just as Gauss would have predicted, we have found two complex roots to this polynomial equation, and in the process, open the door into a completely new dimension of imaginary numbers. Fundamentally, the imaginary unit i is defined as the positive root of p of x, setting the groundwork for the imaginary part of complex numbers. If we return to the map of number sets from earlier, we can now see that the purely imaginary numbers sit outside of the reals and within the complex numbers. What you will begin to see is that we can have any value of i, behaving similar to a variable. After establishing the necessity and legitimacy of the imaginary unit, we have effectively discovered the beginnings of what the complex set has to offer. Upon this, we can begin to perform boundless operations that lead to new and fascinating concepts, beginning with the Cartesian form and more in the next video.